Uh, my name is Dan Wolf. I am a hip hop artist, a performer, and a playwright. I'm a resident playwright at the foundation. I'm so happy you joined us today for the virtual launch of the 2020 Bay Area Playwrights Festival. Uh, yes, I'm gonna be doing some music for you today. Got a special guest in the background right about now. My son Isaac, we're gonna do a song together in a little bit. I'm glad that you joined us today. You could have been anywhere, but you chose to be with us. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for getting down with us. Really appreciate it today. This song right here is for all my word nerds out there. Sorta of like a simile Poet in a street slang is the poetry The gifted get lifted for all the world to see yeah. I spit early in the morning like I'm toothbrushing Drive fast in my car like I'm out rushing Move mountains to the peak and Push past the trouble through the rubble as I roll into the weekend I dodge judgment like raindrops Stay in the here and now With my breath till my brain stops I'm like a beat drop Stay in the cuddy, disappear quicker than your pocket when it's full of money. It's all combustion. I burn bridges with the flicker, it's the hubris is I try to cross them. I get space when I'm flossing. That ain't slang, but my language is aflame when I stay on topic. What came first, the word or the wordsmith? The birth of earth is reversal what the hearse is. The gift of this is the same as the curse is. And in my change at the end of where my verse is, what begins again with the freshest pad and pen? And as the sun ascends, the rhythm hits the one again. It's that rhythm that every poet, rapper, playwright, lyricist, now the list revels in. What's a metaphor? Sorta of like a simile. Poet in a street slang is the poetry. The gifted get lifted for all the world to see. Come on. What's a metaphor? Sort of like a simile Poet in a street slang is the poetry The gifted get lifted for all the world to see This is a dark room and I'm a light I'm burning bright like the fog through this endless night The world's on fire, it's time to fight So bring your pens, your ends, don't forget your knife I paid my dues, but they never paid me back. I'm stuck on you, serious as a heart attack. Tried to walk away more Michael than Fredo. My shape, it keeps shifting. I mold it like Play Doh, but time, it keeps stealing. Breath from my body, ice from my blood, cells from my hottie. My thoughts, they keep storming, dance across the sky. I try to slow them down, but they betray the third eye. Sometimes I'm blind, my vision's getting blurry. Forests for trees, birds for worms eating early. Unknown is up, the known's getting down. If time is worth money, damn, I'm richer. The sound. What's a metaphor? Sorta of like a simile. Poet in a street slang is the poetry. The gifted get lifted for all the world to see. Come on. What's a metaphor? Sorta of like a simile. Poet in a street slang is the poetry. The gifted get lifted for all the world to see. Metaphor. Sorta of like a simile. Poet in a street slang is the poetry. The gifted get lifted for all the world to see. What's a metaphor? Sorta of like a simile Poet in a street slang is the poetry The gifted get lifted for all the world to see Welcome everybody, my name is Dan Wolf This is the virtual announcement of the Playwrights Foundation Bay Area Playwrights Festival 2020 I'm glad that you came to join us You stepped into these rooms You're keeping art alive being a part of the story that needs to continue to be told because even though we're apart we need each other more than ever we need to be together more than ever whether that's emotionally psychologically or physically we need to reach out and connect so thank you for joining again my name is dan dan wolf you can capture me at danny dmic on all social platforms thank you for joining us peace y'all dan wolf enjoy the rest of your afternoon Thank you, Dan. That was such a fun way to start our time together. Uh, Dan is one of our resident playwrights at Playwrights Foundation and is breaking new ground in the world of hip-hop theater and has a new album coming out, so you should follow him and check him out, as well as he and the Bay Area Theater Cypher are performing live every weekend on Facebook and or Twitch, so check him out. It's super fun. Um, but hello to all of you who are tuning in with us today and welcome to our virtual launch party for the 2020 Bay Area Playwrights Festival. 
uh, our first ever live event. So I'm so glad that you can be here with us. I am Jessica Barbeza, the new Executive Artistic Director at Playwrights Foundation, where we are dedicated to supporting and championing new diverse contemporary playwrights. So thank you so much for joining us today from wherever you are sheltering in place as we announce our festival playwrights and also just share a little insight into the selection process. So you'll get a chance to hear from our literary manager, readers on our literary council, and also get to meet the playwrights themselves, which actually would not have been possible if we weren't in this format. So some of the little things to celebrate in this time that we're in right now. Um, we also want to hear from you. So please utilize the comment section. I can already see that a lot of people are in here and saying hi to each other. And I just encourage that you continue to do that as well as share with us about why you love new plays or the festival. Um, we just want to hear from you about why supporting playwrights is so important in this time. Um, and one of the benefits of being online is that you can tune in from your home while you're maybe sitting on your couch, maybe you have pajamas on, maybe you got a little dressed up, maybe you're playing with your kids, making dinner, whatever you need to do. But we're glad that we can be in community with each other right now um, and support these playwrights in the festival. So if you don't already have one, I encourage you to get a drink to have on hand for later so that we can do a toast together from our respective homes. Um, I also wanna see who we have in here with us. Um, so I see we have Octavio Solis, uh, Jonathan Norton, Molly Smith, Emma Goldman Sherdman, Audrey Cephali, Susan Bank, Jessely J. Robinson, Liz, Debbie Affa, Liz Duffy Adams, Shay Sp Shane Spaulding, Margo Hall, Nick Maluco, Linda Brewer, and so many more people are here with us. Um, so we're gonna have a wonderful time today and thank you for joining us. Um, so what is Bay Area Playwrights Festival and what do we do? Well, I am so glad you asked. Uh, and uh, we're gonna play a short three minute video right now that's kind of highlighting the mission of our festival and also where we can hear a little bit from past playwrights who have been in the festival. So take it away. At Playwrights Foundation, we are committed to supporting diverse playwrights who are changing the narratives and forms of contemporary theater. We find that undiscovered playwright or story and give them the resources to gather collaborators and bring their stories to light. Now more than ever, we need stories that uplift, challenge, and create community. Since our founding in 1976, we have served over 500 playwrights, and our annual Bay Area Playwrights Festival has been key to serving their needs. The festival is known as a launch pad for new plays where around 80% move to full production at a professional theater. We've developed plays by Sam Shepard, Milo Cruz, Lauren Yee, Chris Chen, and Lauren Gunderson before they were produced across the country. In May, we will announce five writers selected from an open submission process who will be featured at the festival in July. They need us to take a chance on them and they need you to be a part of it. This is a place where the play is considered first. Playwrights Foundation is important because of the ethos of putting the playwright at the center of the work and trying to, to create an, an experience that's going to support them doing the work they need to do, as well as creating a, a community of, of writers and of artists who all kind of come together for this, this brief time. I wanted to develop my play and I felt that I had hit a wall you know, in doing the work within my circle and the resources I had. It has given me the opportunity to dig deeply into my play in the most beautiful setting I could imagine, um, with a brain trust of heartfelt, sincere, caring, brilliant people. My play is about the Bay Area. It's about home. I grew up here. My parents were immigrants. And I think um, as an adult, I'm looking back and writing about the people that I grew up with and the state of our culture and our country. My play is at a place where I really just want to push it to the next level. I invite you to be a part of the story at Playwrights Foundation. Will you give a gift towards our 43rd annual Bay Area Playwrights Festival? No gift is too small and will be matched up to $15,000 by generous donors for double the impact. 
I also encourage you to share this fundraiser and tell your own story about a play that made a difference in your life. Tell your story on social media and tag it with hashtag be a part of the story and hashtag playwrights foundation. We want to hear about the playwrights who have made an impact in your life. Be a part of the story. Donate and tell your story today. All right, here you go. We are grateful to have generous anonymous donors who have put up a $15,000 match for the festival this summer. And we are almost one third of the way to our goal. And we have one more week to raise the rest of that. So if you can, please give a gift today to support the artists and developing the new plays in this unique time that we find ourselves in. Um, and we do want to hear about the playwrights who have impacted you or why you love new plays. So I encourage you to, hear, to share in the comment section or to share if you donate and to add why you love new plays. You can click on the link in the description or text the number on your screen to give a donation. Theater is a communal event. And even though we may be far away today, we still need you and want you to be a part of the story as we launch these new plays and playwrights into the world. So thank you for being here on this journey. Um, now, how do we select the plays for the festival? Another great question. And one that I have been asked multiple times in my first few months since I started in October. So we wanted to just take um, a little bit of time and demystify the process a little bit. Uh, it's a responsibility that we take very seriously as hundreds of playwrights submit their work to us for the festival through an open selection process that usually starts in August, the year before the festival. It's also a team effort that wouldn't be able to be done without our fabulous literary team and our 150 volunteer readers. Um, our literary team coordinates our readers as well as tracks all of the data for the 735 script submissions that came in. And this year, we also have a brand new literary team with our literary manager, Heather Holinsky, who is a professional dramaturg in Philadelphia and our associate literary manager, Kieran Beckia, who is a director and producer in the Bay Area, and literary intern, Zoe Jovanovich, a playwright from Seattle. So they have done an outstanding job in getting us to where we are today. And this national team has also helped us widen the reach of the organization, as well as those that are involved in the selection process. So a huge thank you to them. And also a huge thank you to all of our readers that participated and were part of the story this year. I know some of you are watching and we couldn't have made it here without you. So thank you so much. Um, now I have asked Heather to join me today to talk about our values and strategies in the selection process. So um, we're gonna, there she is. Hi. Hey. Welcome, Heather. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Where are you sheltering in place today? About 2,871 miles away from y'all in Philly. <laughs> well, Heather is a professional dramaturg in Philadelphia who has worked across the country, but actually trained with Playwrights Foundation founder Robert Woodruff in grad school at ART and Harvard. What does it mean for you to be working at Playwrights Foundation on the Barrier Playwrights Festival, Heather? Oh man, it just means a lot. Um, Woodruff was actually my first teacher in literary office back in 2005, and to um, get the place where he founded 15 years later, um, after I've learned so much uh, uh, working in the field, uh, is really great. And I, I'm so grateful. Well, I'm also super grateful to have you on the team. You have been an invaluable partner as we have jumped in with both of our feet partway through the process in mid-October. So I'm so glad that you can be here today since we're in an online world. Um, I would love for you to kind of share with everyone some of the values that we had in the selection process. Yeah, sure. Um, what we're striving to do is put the playwrights first as we're reading a high volume of scripts over a very short period of months. I know there are a lot of worries on behalf of playwrights as well as mysteries at how we arrive at this decision. Um, first, it's really important to me um, that every play is read by our readers until they get to the words end of play. Writers entrust us with their scripts 
and they're often at a point in their creative journey where they're ready to share their work, but they might be feeling stuck. Uh, stuck in their writing process, stuck in their career, perhaps unable to take their work to the next level. And they're looking for artistic collaborators who will join them in telling a story and get excited about their voice. We ask our readers before they sit down to write an evaluation, um, questions like, um, how is this writer and artist uh, responding to the world around them? Are their intentions clear? And um, do they have a voice that is pushing back on regional theater? Are they trying to take theater in a new direction? Um, we really like writers who are writing something challenging and telling stories you haven't seen before. Um, and uh, I, I know I had to jump into this job very quickly. Um, so Jessica, back then I asked you, um, what are some of the things that we are looking for at Playwrights Foundation? Um, Playwrights Foundation has a history of giving voice to playwrights uh, that are writing narratives. Um, that maybe we haven't heard before and are diverse in the theater landscape. And that can kind of, that can spread um, to different cultures, different races, different abilities, talking about religion, gender identity, economic status, um, and more. And we're also looking for plays that are experimenting with form. Um, and we, we prioritize emerging playwrights who maybe don't aren't a name that most professional theaters or professionals know yet and I know a lot of people are like what does emerging mean does that mean I have to be young or in my 20s um and no I mean emerging you can be in your 20s your 30s your 40s you know maybe you didn't start playwriting until after you had kids and all of a sudden you're ready to be birthed into the world um you know we're looking for people that aren't a known name or a known commodity that we can help support and lift up their voice and provide a little equity in the world. Um, so we're looking to widen the access and elevate the playwrights who deserve a platform. Um, so those are some of the things you know we're looking for when we're reading and what we also share with our readers as they're looking at the scripts. Um, so what does this process actually look like? Um, Heather, can you share with us uh, kind of behind the scenes what the process looks like? Of course, I'd be happy to. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I couldn't do any of this without my teammates, Karen Basia and Zoe Jovanovich, who were immensely helpful. Um, what's important to us is authenticity, uh, which means we need to gather readers um, from across the country who, has, who are as diverse as the playwrights who applied. That diversity means racial diversity, social economic, regional diversity, as well as artists from the disability community. Um, we have a team of 150 readers who are tasked with making sure every play gets read twice and evaluated thoroughly in written reports. After we receive the reports from the National Committee, Karen, Zoe, and I narrow down the selections to about 135 semifinalists. Then our plays are sent to a local Bay Area Literary Council, some of whom you'll meet in just a little bit, um, where we'll share more about that, what that experience is like. The important thing is that our process is democratic and many voices weighing in. I found it rare to gather a group of theater makers to find consensus on what makes a good play. So we try to structure our process so we can discuss the play's promise and potential and share what excites us about new work. Uh, part of what's important for us is to figure out the best ways we can help writers with where they are at the moment. So we also rely heavily on the writer's stated development goals. It's a lot of analysis and it's always such a hard decision. Um, in a short period of time. So we really care about the semifinalists and finalists who made it through our process this year as well. And yeah. if you haven't had a chance to look at that list, we announced it earlier this week. So you should also check out our semi semifinalists and finalists um, because there's a lot of great plays and playwrights on that list as well. I mean, once you get to the finalist stage, every single play is usually a strong play at that point. And there are other factors that start coming into play that we start looking at, you know, what resonates with readers the most in this time that we're in, looking at the play's narratives in context with each other, um, access level, equity, geography of where playwrights are, casting, and so much more. So, you know, and like Heather said, we're also looking at the development goals and can we support that in the development this summer? Um, and this year was unique, honestly, because as we were reading and selecting the plays, we were all going into our stay at home orders. And so it was also thinking about, okay, if we're all online, what are the plays that we can give the best 
um, development process, you know, and there were some plays that we wouldn't have been able to support if we went online in the same way. Um, yeah, it's really hard to do if we're all sheltering in place. Um, sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was hard to do if we were sheltering in place, um, but why don't we brighten everybody's day by sharing our five play rates? Okay, it's time. Oh, and we are so excited to share with you our five plays for the Summer's Festival that were selected from 735 submissions. So in alphabetical order, we have our first play, Mingus, by Tyler English Beckwith. A first, a first generation college student finds a mentor in her Black Studies professor, a former member of the Black Panther Party. Over conversations on theory, jazz, and family, they unlock something inside each other and their relationship develops into an undefined and tangled web of blurred lines. And some quotes from our readers about the play. Phenomenal writing. This playwright needs to be given a platform, beautiful clarity, and unpredictability. Congratulations, Tyler. Our second play is Final Boarding Call by Stephanie Quo. Final Boarding Call tells the human stories of the current Hong Kong protest revolving around interconnected stories of seven characters whose backgrounds and perspectives run the spectrum. Some quotes from our readers include, prescient for our current time, skillfully tackled, rich with storytelling possibilities, and reveals how language and politics are inextricably linked. And our third play, To Saints and Stars by Jordan Ramirez Puckett. Sophia, a NASA astronaut, and Zoe, the wife of a Greek Orthodox priest, have been best friends since childhood, until events cause everything to change. To Saints and Stars explores the intersection of science and faith and the power of lifelong friendship. And some quotes from our readers include, beautiful friendships, crisp dialogue, effective conversations on religion versus science, and a play about sisterhood. Congratulations, Jordan. Our fourth play is Babes in Holand by Janine Reynolds Knox. While attending a predominantly white college, two black students create their own bubble of self-discovery, music, and sanctuary. However, the stress of love, financial hardship, and a persistent lack of privacy threaten to destroy it. Some things our readers said, our characters are really lovely, natural dialogue, challenges class, privilege, and white gaze, and uplifting positive queer women romance. And our final play we have is Derecho by Noel Vinas. In Northern Virginia, sisters Eugenia and Mercedes must confront how traditional Latino values conflict with an American definition of success that is always changing. Some quotes from our readers, unexpected and surprising, real and grounded, beautiful poetry, and grapples with finding your identity in a political world. We're really excited to support these five plays that all have characters who are aspiring to something extraordinary, whether it's a moonshot to Mars or an unforgettable romantic love or desire for peace in their homeland. So this is that moment where if you have a glass, raise your glass with us as we toast these five new plays that will challenge comfort and bring us joy in this time. Cheers. <laughs> actually do need a drink of water. So that was perfect. Um, also, how cool is that graphic design? Shout out to our graphic designer, Den Legaspi. Um, and we will get to meet our playwrights in a few moments. So stick around, but we also have another big announcement. So this year, as we all know, nothing is like we've ever experienced before, um, but we are still committed to supporting the development of these plays at the Bay Area Playwrights Festival this summer. Um, so our other big announcement, which you may not be surprised by this, but is that our entire festival, July 17th through the 26th, will be moving online for the safety of our artists and patrons. But we are not discouraged. We are in fact excited about the opportunities that this provides, especially in the widened access and visibility that going online brings to the festival, but also to our playwrights as we try to launch them into the American theater landscape. Um, so we hope that you'll also come back and join us this summer, July 17th through the 26th, to engage in readings of these new plays and panel conversations and more. 
we also remain committed to hiring local artists as much as possible for the Bay Area Playwrights Festival, even though we're moving online. We want to support our Bay Area artistic community at this time of crisis. Tickets for the readings will be available June 1st and events announced shortly thereafter. If you can give support to the work of all the artists working here this summer, please click on the link in the description or text the number on your screen. And with a gift of 2,500 or more, we also have opportunities to be a producer of a specific play where you will get your name in the program, which we'll have online or special events with the artists. Um, so please reach out to me if you're interested and have a specific play that you hear about today that you have in mind. Um, and I also want to take a moment to thank our generous donors who have already given over $2,500 towards the festival this, this summer. Um, and we have the Turn of Cell Project, David Goldman and Carol Dweck, Kathy Roberts, Bill Gregory, and Linda Brewer. Um, so thank you so much. We wouldn't be able to do this without you. Um, and I also have to thank our board of directors who have been working tirelessly to support us and to make sure that this festival happens this summer. So thank you. Um, it's such a team effort, like we have said before. Um, and I also want to take a moment. Um, we, uh, we have had a donation come in. So thank you, Shane Spaulding, for your donation. We really appreciate it. Um, now that we've shared with you our selections, we'd also like uh, for you to meet some of the Bay Area advocates and allies for new work to help us make these choices and to give you a behind the scenes look on how we arrived at our decision. So right now we're going to invite three members from our Bay Area Literary Council, Lee, Terrence, and Quincy, to share thoughts about their experience on the council, as well as, you know, give insight um, to the various plays. And afterwards, we'll get to meet the playwrights themselves. Here they are. Um, so I'm going to have them introduce themselves and share just a little bit about who they are and some of the highlights of being on the council. Um, so let's start with you, Lee. Hi, my name is Lee Rondon Davis. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. Uh, I have been on the BAPF uh, Literary Council for a few years now. I think this is my second or third year. Um, and I've always really loved being on the council. The process is always a little bit challenging. Um, everyone has such different opinions and they're rooting for their favorite plays and their different perspectives on the work. Um, but it's amazing to have such a great team of folks that are so dedicated to creating new opportunities, um, championing folks of marginalized identities and um, reading all of these amazing plays and now getting to share them with all of you has been really, really wonderful. So I'm grateful for the committee and Playwrights Foundation for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, I can have, pass it off to Quincy, who's right below me. Hi everyone, my name is Quincy Waller, she, her, hers. Um, this is actually my first time being on the Literary Council and it was a wonderful experience, um, an opportunity to take get my eyes on some wonderful new work that's coming into the Bay Area, that's out in the world. Um, really wonderful opportunity to take a look at what creators and artists are doing um, to move the theater community forward. Um, super exciting to take a look at all the plays, to root for these ones that we've chosen, and um, what it was just overall a wonderful experience. Super happy to be here. I'll pass it off to Terrence. Hey everybody, Terrence Anthony, he, him. Um, I'm a playwright. I had the good fortune to have a play included in last year's Bay, Ra Bay Area Playwrights Festival, um, which was very exciting. And this is the first year that I'm on the Literary Council, which after years and years of being on the opposite side of submitting and getting rejected, um, to just to see how much work goes into the decisions here and um, to be able to discover all these amazing playwrights um, some that I didn't I had no idea who they were and other work that that I was aware and and finding new work that they were doing was really uh, exciting and very I'm very grateful for the opportunity I had this year it was a lot of uh, a lot of work and a lot of fun great thank you all for sharing um, I also want to share uh, a comment. We also have some of our national committee readers with us and Samantha Bard shared, I'm a dramaturg and new plays are my favorite. 
I absolutely love helping to bring the ideas and hard work of playwrights to the public, and I loved being a member of the BAPF National Committee this year. Thank you so much, Samantha, and for being here. Um, now we would love to have a conversation about each of the plays and you know why people love them and you can hear more about the plays and then also we'll get to meet the playwrights themselves. Um, so who we're gonna start with Mingus by Tyler English Beckwith. Uh, who wants to go first? Um, I will start. Um, Mingus is an amazing play. Um, it's a two-hander, which to me is uh, are the most uh, difficult kinds of plays to write successfully, I think. And Tyler just does such an amazing job um, creating two characters, two black characters who are brilliantly realized and um, they're engaged in this dance, this emotional and intellectual dance that keeps you on the edge of your seat throughout the entire play, wondering what, how this is going to resolve and which directions the, the, each character is going to go. Um, I'm really excited that uh, this is a part of the festival this year. And yeah, congratulations, Tyler. It's really, really great piece. Love to see where this is going to go. Thank you. Yeah, Mingus was a play I read early on in the, the reading process, and uh, it's really stuck with me kind of from the beginning. It was one of one of my favorites um, from this cycle, and I just think it's so powerful to see um, two really accomplished Black folks um, in an academic institution. I think there's not a lot of work out there that um, focuses on that in this way, and uh, highlights them as complicated human beings who have really amazing ideas and the, the discussions that they're having in the classroom between B, the student and Harris and the professor are just amazing. Like the way the, it's captured in the play has been, um, was really well done. And I'm excited to like hear some voices behind it and see where the play goes next. Thank you. I'll, I'll um, also add that um, Tyler um, included in her development goals that um, she was uh, struggling with the jazz structure of the play that's really integral to the story. And um, that was a very compelling um, uh, thing that she's mentioned that I, I'm so glad that we get to work that, uh, for her and offer that support. Yeah, it was really wonderful to get a chance to read the play. Similar to Lee, I uh, got to read it very early on in the process. And it stuck with me um, with its very well thought out characters, um, a really great representation of academia, um, of female young black women and um, college kind of figuring out her identity, feeling, figuring out who she is. Um, I learned so much from this play um, and it really kept me at the edge of my seat. I'm really excited to see where it comes, um, where it comes next and to have it in the festival this year. Great, thank you all for sharing. Um, now I would like to introduce our playwright, Tyler English Beckwith, and have a conversation about Mingus. <laughs> Hi, Tyler. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Parents, a reminder to turn your video off. <laughs> <laughs> live. We're live, people. Um, where are you sheltering in place today, Tyler? I'm in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and can you share with us, what are some of the things in this time as you're sheltering in place that are bringing you joy? Um, the Real Housewives of Atlanta. <laughs> Nene Leakes. <laughs> uh, I love that. That's awesome. We all have our shows that we're watching right now to keep us sane. Um, well, uh, we're so excited to have you in the festival. Um, and I, we'd love to hear a little bit about what was the inspiration for writing Mingus? Sure, um, I was a black studies major in undergrad and I was just so intrigued by this world of academia that was focused solely on the scholarship of liberation and revolution. Um, I didn't really, I knew it existed, but I didn't really understand the ins and outs of it before I got to college. And once I was there, I was very interested in the way that interpersonal relationships worked within academia and how they could be muddy and beautiful at the same time. So um, when I sat down to write Mingus, that was the first thing that I thought of this very cool and weird and overwhelming time that I had while I was in 
in undergrad. Great, thanks for sharing. Yeah. Um, and what are you looking forward to in being a part of the festival this summer? Um, I'm really looking forward to working more on Mingus. I feel like I understand the play now more than I ever have before. It's been nearly a four year process since I first started writing it. Um, and I think at this point, I feel really comfortable with who the characters are. And this time of development is to really discover all that I can about who they are that I couldn't get to alone. So I think it was mentioned before, um, Harrison is a jazz or was a jazz musician. And um, I don't know much about jazz music academically. Um, so I think it'll be really interesting to learn that side of him. Um, to get another person who um, is possibly a black a black study scholar as well, um, to work with me um, with uh, some of the more academic language that I put in, which I feel comfortable with right now, but I would love to get, you know, a check off on it. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, thank you for sharing all of that. And we will come back around. We have a Q and A with all of our playwrights at the end of our time here today. Today, So if you have questions for Tyler or for our playwrights in general, please be putting them in the comment box and we'll come back around. So thank you so much, Tyler. Thank you. Uh, I also want to say thank you to Chris Smith for your donation. I really appreciate it. It's super helpful in this time, anything that we can have. Um, and we're going back to our literary council right now. And we're going to talk about our next play, Final Boarding Call by Stephanie Quo. Um, who would like to start off and share a little bit about what you loved about this play? I can get us started. Um, so Fighting Bo Final Board and Call is really exciting to me in that it looks looking at a specific political movement at a specific point in time. Um, so the protests going on in Hong Kong right now or right before this and hopefully afterwards. And um, what I found especially powerful about this piece was that there are all of these characters from these different cross sections of life, the totally different, you know, socioeconomic backgrounds, political, cultural, um, you know, class backgrounds, and that makes them feel so different, but then they're all kind of connected through this movement. And it, it's a play about people finding their own personal power and what it, what makes a person an activist and what can bring someone to that point. Um, so it was really, really powerful to read. Um, and I'm really excited to see what happens next for this play. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I really uh, think this play swings for the fences. Um, the playwright takes a really huge scope and um, a wide, you know, kind of uh, sweeping look at this political historical moment and one that I think a lot of us in America don't have a real accurate idea um, of, of the reality of at this point. So this yeah, has the potential to be a really important play and yeah, kudos to the playwright for really taking on something that, that's such a, a big uh, project. Thank you. Anybody else like to share anything else? I'll add that um, the way that she interweaves these seven lives as their lives are being disrupted um, just felt so relevant and a story that um, we didn't want to forget about where we're all sheltering in place. Um, and it's also written in a way that's very accessible to understand the politics for American audiences. Great, thank you all. Um, uh, now, I would like to introduce our playwright, Stephanie Quo, who actually couldn't be here with us today, but we do have a recorded live video, so you do get to meet her. All right. Hi, Stephanie. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for joining us here on video. Um, tell us where you're sheltering in place right now. Yeah, um, I am in my mom's house. Um, I'm in Hong Kong. I was sheltering in Taiwan for six, seven weeks, and then decided to come back to Hong Kong where I'm in um, government mandated quarantine for 14 days. Great, yeah, I mean, everyone is in different places. And where were you before Taiwan? <laughs> I was in I was in New York, well, I was in Colorado doing a festival, which obviously was canceled, sadly, um, and then went back to New York and then 
realized pretty soon that I should get out if I want to get out um, and come home. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, well, we're very excited to have you in the festival this summer and to be able to develop your play Final Boarding Call. And I would love for you to share with all of us what was the inspiration for writing Final Boarding Call? Yeah, um, inspiration is a funny word. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I, I think, I mean, because I'm, I'm originally born and raised in Hong Kong and um, consider this place home. And so um, I, I was following all the events in Hong Kong for the past year. Um, and it's especially interesting looking at how it went from protests to um, the virus and now it's shifting kind of back to protests and moving back and forth and just like the dynamics of that, even with the idea of face masks alone um, and having a lot of conversations about it. So the, the, the events here have been on my mind for a long time, um, but then a friend around August reached out and was like, hey, are you writing a play about it? Um, and I was like, no, like, I'm not going to capitalize on my city's pain. That seems totally whack. Um, and then he said, you know, because if you don't write it, someone's going to write it. And that person might very well be a 30 year old white man who's never been to Hong Kong. Um, and that felt super real and also scary and also sad. Um, and I thought a lot about it and thought a lot about, well, if I am to tell a story from my city, it feels very heavy because it will be a, a supposed like one representation of this place for all of America, which is an exaggeration, but you know, it's, it's no one expects a story in America to represent all of America, but the story about Hong Kong will represent all of Hong Kong in America whenever one person sees it, who's never been there or will never go. Um, and so I, I struggled for a long time with what kind of story I want to tell um, and, and how to tell it by giving a nuanced view of the protests and the city and its history. Um, yeah. Well, I'm so glad we can partner with you on your journey as you're developing this piece. And I'm curious what you're looking forward to, to the festival this summer. I know it's going to be in a different format and you'll be there and we'll be here and we're going to make it work, but what are you looking forward to? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm just excited to work with people. Um, you know, from isolation, uh, I am really excited to see what actually the medium of virtual conversations does for the play, especially because the play includes actual mess messaging on apps, and it's not a ton, but there is some um, technology in it, so that, that'll that be interesting, and I'm excited to work with new artists from the Bay Area. Um, I've never worked with the Bay Area um, at all, with a community in the Bay Area, and so I'm excited to meet new artists. Um, local artists, which takes on a whole new meaning when you're not local yeah. to the place. Um, but just working with people and having a process um, that's a little longer for this play um, because it's pretty new as of like November. Um, I haven't had a chance to kind of like work extendedly on the play. Um, so I'm really excited to do that. Great. Well, thank you so much for, you know, sitting down and having a brief conversation. And I'm sorry you couldn't be here with us live right now, yeah. um, but it is like 5 a.m. your time. So we're not going to do that to you. <laughs> thank you for having me. <laughs> All right. Bye. Thank you so much, Stephanie. We're so sorry you couldn't be here with us today, but we are excited for us to work on this process together in all of our time zones. Um, I also want to take a moment and just thank a few more donors. Thank you so much, Kelsey Bryan and Markham Miller, for your donations today to help support the festival. Thank you. Um, we're now going to talk about our next play, To Saints and Stars by Jordan Ramirez Puckett. Uh, who wants to take it away on this one? I will take it away on this one. Um, it's a sci-fi play. So for me, that automatically gets me really excited. I think one thing theater definitely needs is more great sci-fi plays. Um, and this one not only is sci-fi, it talks about science, religion, um, it's grounded in uh, relationships, a lifelong friendship, and it uh, moves between time and space in a way without losing the, the emotional core um, of the story. And yeah, I just 
really excited about this play. Um, and again, super glad that it's gonna be in this festival. Can't wait to uh, hear actors get a hold of this and really um, begin to bring it to the next step. Yeah, Thank what you. I really loved about this play was that it centers a relationship, but not a romantic relationship, but a relationship between two good friends, basically sisters, and um, the way you see them love each other and fight with each other and come into their own identities. I think that's really powerful um, and really stand by their beliefs and what they hold dear to the themselves. Um, and I think what's most exciting about this piece is I just keep imagining like young women of color coming to see this play, particularly young Latinx folks and see themselves be able to be an astronaut or find, um, live within their faith in a way that feels comfortable and authentic to them. And I think that's so powerful to see on stage right now. And so I'm really delighted that this play made it part of the festival. Thank you. Who wants to go next? Um, I'll add that I just feel science plays are really hard to write. Um, I've worked on several myself. Um, so I was just really impressed um, with the writing of the question regarding faith and doubt. Um, and that these, uh, yet it's so character centered and they, these two women are trying to break the glass ceilings in their respective fields. Um, but it just has, such wonderful, heartfelt, witty dialogue. Um, and we're glad that we can support her um, in her research process. Um. Wonderful, thank you all for sharing. Uh, now I would like to introduce our playwright, Jordan Ramirez Puckett. Uh, and I'm also gonna take this time while we're transitioning to thank uh, Anna, more donors. So thank you, Nancy Quinn. Thank you so much for your donation. It really means a lot, I appreciate it. Hi, Jordan. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> where Where are you today? Where are you sheltering in place? I am in the Bay Area in a little town called Newark. Uh, great. And I'm I'm curious. You know, what are some of the things that are bringing you joy in this time that you're sheltering in place at home? Yeah, I started a little patio garden in my <laughs> apartment, and my tomatoes just sprouted, and I'm over the moon about it. <laughs> That's so wonderful. Uh, well, we're we're so looking forward to having you a part of the festival, especially as a Bay Area playwright. Um, and we'd love to hear a little bit more about what inspired you to write to Saints and Stars. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm at an age where a lot of my friends are having babies. And I right now am definitely prioritizing my career. So I wanted to write a play about these two lifelong friends, one who's pregnant with her first child and one who goes on the first man mission to Mars and um, follow their journey through that. Um, and ultimately at the end of the day, this play really is a love letter to my lifelong friend who's been with me through thick and thin. So, um, and, and to all the women in my life. So I'm really excited to be developing, developing it with the Barry Playwrights uh, Festival. And what are you looking forward to most about developing it this summer? Yeah, I so I'm born and raised in the Bay Area, have been here basically my whole life, but I uh, just actually I just graduated from grad school on Friday. Ah, uh, woohoo! Congratulations! <laughs> Toast to that! <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, um, so to, I was in Ohio for three years, wrote this play while I was there. And so to be able to come back as a graduate of an MFA playwriting program and to work with Bay Area artists uh, on a play of mine is just a dream come true. It really feels like a homecoming. So I'm so excited. Uh, well, we're excited too. So, um, well, we're looking forward to having more conversation at the end when we come together for our Q&A at the end. Great, thank you. And also a reminder to all of you, if you have questions for the playwrights, uh, put them in the comment box. Um, we're gonna be going back to our literary council right now and having conversations about our next play, um, but we will please put questions so that we uh, can ask your questions and not our questions at the end. Um, 
All right, our next play, Babes in Holand by Deneen Reynolds Knott. Who wants to kick it off for this one? Oh, me? definitely <laughs> me. Uh, so Babes in Holand was actually one of the earliest plays that I read for the festival. And I was like, this is it. This is the play for me. I, there, I love this play. And I think part of it was that I saw so much of myself in this piece. Um, the story follows two young Black women who are in uh, college at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and they fall in love. And what it felt so refreshing about this piece was that it was a queer love story between two Black women that didn't necessarily center trauma. Um, and I think the world needs a little bit of that right now, something sweet and funny. It's also so set in the 90s so uh Deneen has done an amazing job with the soundtrack like if you read the play you can listen along to the music and just be in the zone and it was just such a magical transformative experience and um I'm so excited about this piece I cannot stop reading about it <laughs> yeah I'll jump on the train with Lee it was really a phenomenal read it was one of the um I read it midway through the process, but um, I really loved this experience of um, young women discovering who they are in college in the 90s. And it centers around both, you know, you're in college, you're learning into, you know, how to share a room with a stranger and discovering yourself. You're discovering what love and um, compassion and intimacy means as you kind of take this new step in life. And it really centers around investigating that and taking the time to, um, you know, really compose a story around some really beautiful characters. So I am also really excited that this is in the festival this year. Um, I'll, I hope this comes across right, but this is a play that I wish had been produced in the 90s, but back then we weren't doing queer romances. Um, we were, hold on, here we go. Again, with the technical. Um, we weren't doing queer mo romances by Black women. We were doing Stoppard and we were doing Mammoth. So this play just has a nostalgia factor um, for a very specific time and place um, at Pittsburgh in the 90s. Um, she's also got some really great Pittsburgh references that I relate to, Pamela's Pancakes. Um, and uh, just this play just captures the sweet innocence of first love um, and the challenges of being in the academy. Great, thank you. All right, we're gonna introduce our playwright, Deneen Reynolds Knott, and have a little conversation about Babes in Holand. Uh, Hi, Deneen. Hi. <laughs> how are you? I'm good. Hey, how are you, Jessica? I'm doing good. This <laughs> is, you know, such a unique experience, but it's actually really fun. Um, where are you sheltering in place today? I'm in Brooklyn, New York. And who who is at home with you in Brooklyn? Oh, <laughs> uh, my husband, my eight-year-old, and my 10-year-old. Wonderful. Um, and can you, we're so excited to have you a part of the festival this summer. Um, and we're very curious to hear from you. What inspired you to write Babes in Holand? Sure. With most of my work, like a few inspirations converge. So yeah. My niece was starting her college search, and then I started to reflect on my time on campus in the 90s, and the music, and the energy, and this time of like trying to seek intimacy in a situation where there's like forced closeness. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also thinking a lot about sanctuary and the way that we seek sanctuary in spaces and sanctuary with people um, and in relationships. So. Yes, I was thinking about all those things and that became the play. <laughs> yeah. And what are you looking forward to most for in the festival this summer? I'm just really excited to work with a creative team and to dig more into the play and um, working with a dramaturg and a director and actors and really talking about the play and, and thinking about it and thinking about what works and thinking about what could be better and just making it like the strongest draft it can be. And then also hearing about these other plays, I can't wait to see them and to hear more about that process. I think we are going to have a digital artist retreat. So I'm really excited because we've been hanging out in the green room and it's a great group. So 
<laughs> I know. I love this. This is a so wild green. Room. It's wild in the green room. <laughs> um, so yeah. So we're looking forward to that. That's awesome. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you, Deneen. We're going to hear more at the end when we come back for a playwright Q and A. Um, but, and so now we're going to go back to Red Lake Council, but if you have any questions for the play, playwrights, please put them in the comment box and we'll gather questions for the end in our Q&A with the playwrights. Or if you want to share more about why you love new plays or the festival or what you're excited about, you know, share with us. Um, now we're going to talk about Derecho by Noelle Venus. All right. Who wants to go first this time? I'll take it off. Um, Dereto is such a phenomenal play. Um, it centers around two sisters um, in a Latinx community. Um, one of them trying to navigate what she, how, how she wants to um, lead her community with the culture that she was brought up in, but um, figuring out how her identity and how she wants to represent it. Is it authentic? Is it how she wants it to be? And does it represent a community as a whole? Um, and also navigating what it's like to uh, like intimate relationship between two sisters during a storm. Um, and it all converges and truth becomes truth and identity is really revealed. It's such a beautiful play. Um, it mixes between moments of reality and moments of um, whimsical mysticism. And um, it's just really a phenomenal play. One of the best plays that I, I found and I really am super excited that it was in the festival. Yeah, I think this play um, really does a great job of incorporating like, yeah, magical realism elements along with politics um, and identity politics, but in a way that doesn't, you know, make the bog the play down. And it's really about the characters that are really amazingly drawn and the dialogue is great. And uh, the way the play moves is just really exciting to me. And it's it, having having a play that is so distinctly American, uh, the uh, story in, in today's America is something that I think uh, was really exciting uh, for me to read. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Heather. Um, I'll add that just um, all of these plays that we read, even the 35 finalists um, are so intersectional. Um, it was um, just a uh, delight to read this one. Um, it's also a play that um, is working hard of what does it mean to avoid stereotypes when you're under the pressure of the spotlight of the political arena in DC, um, as well as just being a, a wonderful play that's experiment between poetic moments as well as family drama um, uh, while there's this big storm outside. So um, just lovely and once again, congratulations. Thank you. Well, now I would like to introduce our playwright, Noelle Vinas, and get a moment to chat about her play a little bit. Um, I also want to thank a couple more donors. We have Stanley Mazur and Enrique Urita. Thank you so much for your donations. And I apologize if I miss, have misspelled or mispronounced anyone's name through this process, but I am so grateful for everyone's donation. And Noelle. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, where are you sheltering in place today? Um, I'm in Montville, New Jersey. Uh, we had to leave Crown Heights with my future in-laws and these beautiful decoy ducks. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's beautiful weather out here. Uh, what are some things that are bringing you joy in this time while you're sheltering at home? Um, I am reading quite a bit of fantasy, and that includes like fantasy from my childhood, like things I read that are definitively YA novels, um, and then like tomes that are like 700 pages long. So that <laughs> escaping into fantasy is really giving me a lot of joy and a lot of inspiration um, because it's hard to write. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, we're so excited to have you a part of um, have you a part of the festival, and it's really exciting for me because uh, the first thing that I worked on when it came in is we did you know an eight hour reading of this play. You're a resident playwright of the Playwrights Foundation, um, and it's wonderful for us to take it into the next step. And I'm actually curious if you would share, because some folks may have seen a reading of the Dacho. You know, what are you what are you still working on? What are you hoping to accomplish in the festival? 
Yeah, um, there's there's a lot. <laughs> I mean, I think I think the play is tricky because it's a six person ensemble play, and um, it's important that every character gets their full uh, life and attention given to them. But at the same time, there's all of these things that I feel the need as a playwright to be an expert in. Like, despite growing up in the DC area, I feel like I need to be more of an expert in politics. Um, and what it's like to run for office and what it's like to constantly be campaigning. I feel like there's the, the whole virtue of living through the storm. And even though I started writing this play while living through a storm, there are things that you forget, like things that, you know, being trapped inside of a house remind you of. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to kind of breaking open some of the structure of this play. Um, I think the magical realism was mentioned before um, by some of the readers. And I think that that is, I think, the key to the play. Those barrio moments really kind of hold the play open and let we'll let it be what it needs to be but right now I haven't figured it out <laughs> so I think there's a lot of um, I'm really excited to kind of be challenged in a new way to discover how those can really how the structure can devolve in the way I want it to devolve in a way that kind of leads to a new opening great and can you share with us a little bit more about what inspired you to write the play yeah um so in 2012 the DC area which is where I grew up um had a derecho which is a kind of crazy storm um, and I was back home from uh, college, an undergrad, and I was interning at Arena Stage. And it was the first time that I was kind of really closely observing because I was just I, I was trying to be a playwright for the first time in my life. Um, how many different communities I moved through, and how I code switched, and how I operated to continue and uphold my citizenship of those communities. Um, and I noticed that the way I operated in those different ways was really different. Um, so, <laughs> so because of that, those 12 pages I wrote, I then back in the Bay Area was a part of this amazing Latinx playwrights circle. Um, and I brought those 12 pages that I'd written as like a 20 year old into the room and they were like, there's something here. And so part of that inspiration was, you know, what happened six, well now eight years ago, but also like the community of writers and Latinx um, people that I was like in conversation with to keep going and exploring like, what does it mean to be a person of color and what does that label mean and how is that commodified for politicians and how does that show up in our current society um, and how can you do right by your community when your community is not a monolith um, so yeah that's a very long answer to your question <laughs> oh it's great yeah. i love hearing about it um and what are you looking forward to this summer at the festival um i'm really pumped to be working with bay area artists again um i I've only been living in Brooklyn for a year um, and, I and I left the Bay Area to go to grad school. Um, so a big part of what I'm pumped about is kind of being able to work with the artists that I have been working with, um, being able to like have them challenge me and push me and also just kind of getting a sense of like being back with collaborators that I've just had for multiple years in a, in a different and a heightened way. And in a way that we will have like way more hours than we had before mm -hmm. and more resources than we had before to work on, on this particular play. Um, so, and obviously exploring this new medium <laughs> that's happening right now. Right? So, yeah, yeah, I know it's gonna be different for us all. Uh, well, fabulous. Um, we're gonna invite our other playwrights, but also while the other playwrights are coming, I, forgot to toast our fabulous lit council before they left. I am so grateful for them and their thoughts and their words and the three that were here, but also to our entire team of 20 who read and helped us select the finalists and, um, and now our festival playwrights. So cheers. Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna have a playwright Q&A um, and we do have some questions that came in from uh, our viewers who are tuning in today. Um, and I'm going to start off with a question from Patricia Williams, who asks, what are you expecting or hoping for now that the festival is going to be remote, that it's going to be online? I'm really excited for um, my grandma to see it. <laughs> yeah, I want to jump on that. Like my family is all in Virginia for the most part or in South America. No, my South American relatives probably may not tune in, but, I, <laughs> but I do, but for, for all my like people in Virginia, I think the increased access is so huge. Yeah. And, um, my play, maybe strangely enough, the scenes between the two main characters mostly take place over, well, in the play, it's like holographic video chat. So I'm really excited to see, how working in this medium might support what is already in the text. 
Yeah. Anyone else? Anything else you're thinking about or, or what you're looking forward to or now that it's going to be remote? I'm just excited about the possibilities of who will be able to see it for sure. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I guess if it's like a Zoom reading, some of the scenes will be really interesting. Maybe the actors will be like dancing on screen on Zoom and <laughs> so there's certain things in my play. I'm like, that might be really interesting or maybe really energetic and exciting to see on Zoom. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, another question from someone, Max Dennings asks, what do you find helpful about developmental readings like these? For me, table work. All right, I, I love like having the reading and then discussing it and actors starting to like defend their characters or explain what they think their characters are doing or say, oh, I don't actually, I don't really know what this is. And I, I find those conversations so helpful in the process. Yeah, I definitely want to co-sign on that, um, especially having uh, an actor read a line or make a character choice that is totally different than what I imagined is so useful because sometimes they do something that's different and you're like, oh, that's brilliant. I'm going to keep that. Maybe I can support it. And sometimes they do something you're like, oh, no, I guess my text isn't very clear. Uh, let me go in and see what I can do to clarify this for maybe a future production where I'm not in the room. So um, it's just great for being able to workshop that. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think a lot of it is the questions that people ask and the sense that they, and and the, because they're collaborators, they're, it's almost, it's like an approximation in some ways of what it will be like to have a long development process and a developmental reading allows you to really kind of work with collaborators and come up with artistic choices or like measure the strength of your existing artist, artistic choices. And so I really feel like without developmental readings, I mean, I personally create art works in, in ensemble, like with friends, like I've never written a play and not had friends come over to read it aloud, but it's like, I get to have friends read things aloud in my living room for like 20 hours, <laughs> you know? Like it, fe it feels like there's a community that now can support the project that isn't just stealing time away from their normal schedule. Um, and it so really will be in your living room. Yes, it will actually be in my living room, just like it is with that first draft. Um, and unfortunately, I can't like make the Milanesas or anything like I normally would. But you know, there's there's that option of like being in community and like being able to work together and be like, what? How do we push pull against what already exists? Yeah, I'm really excited about the um, having fresh eyes on the play. Um, having done developmental readings on Mingus before, every time that um, a new person reads it or sees it, um, there are new questions that they ask and new takes on the play that they have. And they're always extremely helpful to me as I'm going forward and rewriting. Um, and sometimes I ask questions that I'm like not ready to answer, but um, usually there are questions that need answers, like what is this play about? And what is this character's intention? Um, so when I'm faced with the, the, with the fact that I have to answer that question, it just, it only makes the, the play better. Thank you. Um, our next question we have from Doug Bank, who asks, what inspires you about playwriting as opposed to writing prose or poetry or for film? Well, because you get to work with people <laughs> like constantly. And it's and I think that there's like this sense of um, there's what you write. And that is it hopefully in, in many ways, like set in stone and done. But there's so many things that can happen live. Um, and there's a liveness, I think, that always questions what we're doing and how well we can achieve it. Um, and so I think that there's this particular suspense that exists when you write a play. You're like, yeah, I wrote the play and the play exists, but I, I could watch tons of performances of the same play, knowing what it's about and knowing that I wrote it and, and, and anything could happen, like all sorts of shit could hit the fan. So I think that that is a real, uh, for me, that's a real excitement that always brings me back to the form of theater. Yeah, and for me to... Um, to steal a quote from Lorca, you know, a play is a poem standing up. And so I really find that with playwriting, there's a certain of certain amount of lyricism with the dialogue that you can play with and get away with 
in a way that is not always the way that I write, not always the most naturalistic. It's slightly heightened um, and wouldn't translate to film or TV, um, but works really well when you have live bodies on stage with um, live audience in an ideal situation. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I think that there's the writing, the quality of writing is different in playwriting and the poetry and the musicality of it that I love. I would say I'm, I'm very process oriented and like thinking about pro process versus product. And so I love that with theater, you could always make a change. There's always something that's not a final, there's no final. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. It can always change. It can always morph. It can always be updated. Um, and that keeps me engaged and it keeps me really interested and, and excited to keep collaborating and see what happens. I also think that um, the difference um, between playwriting and other dramatic mediums is the power that playwrights have. And um, going into a room, there's not much power that writers have in film or television. Um, over a dominion of their idea. And so as a playwright saying that what I write down is what happens, period. And that is just a powerful thing that I feel only really happens in the theater um, where you get to actually create what you want to create. And it is always collaborative, of course, but um, you, you get this true sense of knowing that this is something that came from you and you can change it in the ways that feels mo most authentic to you or you cannot. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have another question that's actually specifically for Noel. Um, and this is from Octavio Solis. And he says, clearly you and we have to get our ducks all in a row as we can see behind you. <laughs> um, but derecho, is there any use of code switching in the dialogue? There, there is, there is, there is code switching that happens almost Im immediately. Well, not immediately, but pretty, pretty quickly in the play, you start realizing that the protagonist has fragment, a fragmented sense of self, and there is a self that she performs with her white friends that she wants to donate to her campaign, and there's a self that she performs with her family, and there's a self that she performs with the people that she grew up with back in the hood. So, I, and those selves kind of converge, and so that code switching suddenly starts happening a lot more. <laughs> and is forced to happen a lot more. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, code switching is big in the play. Thanks, we have two more questions um, in our Q&A. So our next one's from Scott Patrick Ray Ragel. Um, after you've heard your play read, do you usually go back and rework the script based on what you observed or do you like to leave it alone? I leave it alone for at least a, a couple of weeks if I'm able to, if there's not a deadline. I like to leave it alone and then um, approach it with the freshest eyes possible. Mm. It just helps me to, you know, I'll write things down and I'll reflect on it during that time, but then come back to it and things, hopefully solutions will be revealed because mm -hmm. I, I let it be for a couple of weeks. I think it depends on what I observed. I think like as a playwright in your heart, like in your body, you know when something that you see or know is very urgent and it's like, oh, absolutely. This is like what was lying beneath, of course, like this is exactly what needs to happen in this moment. And then there are other things that you observe, observe and you're not sure if that one needs to happen, but it does bubble up something in you when you, and for me, I definitely have to like sleep on that, see what that is, see if that is, is, is something that belongs in this particular play. But for the urgent things that I feel like, oh, absolutely, this is like what I was missing the whole time. Of course this happens. I change that pretty quickly because it just feels so intense. Um, and then for the things that I feel like I have to sleep on, I absolutely take my time. Yeah, I would agree with Tyler that for me, it's a mix of, of things like there are certain things that have been troubling me and the solution exists in the room. And I'm like, great, we need to see if this works now. Um, but then separately, there's the decisions that that implicitly I don't want to make yet. And usually they show up for me as like a, a, a pushback. A, I don't I don't think so. I don't think so. And then maybe like three months later, 
like, <laughs> or maybe a reading later. Like I, I Miguel Cruz was mentoring me a little bit and was kind of sharing feedback on this play. And I was originally like, no, I don't think that's the right move. And then a reading later, I was like, oh, this is, Miguel was right, like this was the move. <laughs> so like it's, it always eventually comes up, but there are the things that your body first responds to and says yes. And then there's the later that only comes after the uh, subconscious is made conscious. Yeah, and I'll just hop in and say, I tend to be on the rewrite right away side of the spectrum, only because I feel like I can't move on to the next project until I've done all the rewrites that I feel like I can do in that moment. And obviously that doesn't mean I fixed the play, you know, the, the play is perfect. Um, it's never perfect, but I definitely try to address everything I can uh, sooner so that I can then move on to my next play. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. Um, even though we do have two questions here, I'm gonna ask both questions. We're gonna just gonna do both of these questions. So uh, Enrique asks, um, I'm very interested on how time operates on stage. Can you talk about how time works in your play? Is it moving forward, backward? Is it fragmented, cyclical, expansive? Um, yeah, if you could, each of you can spend a moment talking about that. That's such a great question though. I just wanna shout that out. <laughs> Um, time in my play is very important because it takes place over the course of an academic year, um, which was not always the structure of the play. But after rewriting it several times, I realized that time is very important because we go from seeing Harrison and B at the beginning of their relationship to what eventually becomes the end of their relationship. Um, and so much of it, it surrounds um, the writing of this essay for a scholarship. And so I knew that time had to become more of a structure than just like a fact of being on stage. And um, actually putting that constraint on myself made everything so much easier to say that, oh, of course in September they would have this type of relationship, but by December, who knows what's happening there. Um, and then the natural um, break between fall semester and spring semester, what happened over Christmas break, those like asking myself those questions of like what happens in this time that we don't actually see on stage um, was really helpful, super helpful to me actually. Um, time in my play is very porous purposely. Um, I think uh, there, there's a part in the play where it's, uh, someone says like the past is right here in this room and it feel, for me, it, it's really important that the past and the present is experienced by at least two characters simultaneously um, because they are living in both situations. So for me, it's like the poetic moments kind of bring us back into the past, but the past is kind of happening on, a, on the same timeline as the play occurs and you start learning about events in the past as the present unfolds too. Um, so they kind of exist on two timelines and often jump into each other would be the way I would describe it. Yeah, my play for the most part is linear, um, but it's broken up by uh, childhood scenes from the two main characters. Really, it's one childhood scene that's broken up throughout the play um, so that we learn about their past as we're seeing their present. Mine is linear as well. Um, time is marked by the sun or actually missing the sun because it's a sunless winter. And so it's getting gloomier and gloomier on campus as students are yearning for it and to see it and to feel the warmth of it. Thank you. And thank you for that great question. All of these questions have been really great. Um, and our last question before, um, before we kind of wrap up is, uh, Margot Hall asks, Noelle had mentioned that she was having a hard time writing right now. Um, is that the same with some of the rest of you? Are you able to write or is it hard in this time? Yeah, I've been, <laughs> I've set a goal for myself of sitting at my computer for an hour a day. Um, and I've been doing that maybe like 75% of the time. And then of that 75% of the days that I sit at my computer, like half of that time <laughs> something worthwhile is written, but I'm trying to like keep up the ritual of just sitting at the computer, even if nothing comes out. Uh, so I guess that's my long way of saying, yes, it has been very hard to write right now. I'm not writing anything new, I'm revising. 
um, because I do have a deadline. I'm in a writer's group right now. Um, so I've been balancing that with the remote schooling for my second and fifth grader. So I try to get up before they get up and do that. Um, yeah, I don't know when I'm going to attack something new. I think revising is good for now <laughs> for what I'm able to do. I'm like Deneen, I've been writing towards some deadlines for work and other um, writers groups that I'm in, but I, I'm the same way. I haven't really been writing anything new. When I do sit down to write, it's more of like a free write of like whatever is coming to my mind in that moment. Um, and some cool ideas have come out of that, but I'm not sure what that is. I'm just probably need to get some words out of my head for a little while. But um, it's been extremely difficult to even conceive of starting something brand new. Absolutely. How, how do you all think uh, having the festival, knowing it's coming up in a few months, might kind of affect that? I guess it's more revising, so it's not starting anything new, but... I mean, I what think do you it makes think? it, oh, sorry, I jumped No, go ahead. Uh, um, I think it makes a big difference because I do want to clarify, I feel like uh, it's hard for me to write new stuff because I don't know what the future, what the future holds, um, not even in the next year or multiple years. But I do think when I'm, when I'm writing for a cohort or an ensemble, like um, the NYC Latinx Playwright Circle is still meeting on a weekly basis. And I, I have like a community to read my work aloud in that, in that respect. So there are, when there are people there, I can write for them. And so I think for the festival, I feel really excited to write for Bay Area artists and for the people that will be able to watch. And so having that as a goal, I think will actually be a bright spot for me. Um, that's at least the way I, I think it will go or I hope it will go. <laughs> Yeah, I rewrite a ton during rehearsal process. They're just my favorite part of doing all this is to have a rehearsal process. And I love writing towards actors' voices. So I know I'll be making lots of little changes along the way. And I, I can't wait for that. I'm very excited for that part. Yeah, rewriting feels sort of like a warm blanket right now because it's like a world I already know I feel safe in and I feel like I'm aware of the things that are happening in that play. So I actually look forward to doing the rewriting on Mingus, but um, it is daunting to think that like I would start fresh on a blank page. That's the scariest thing ever right now. But something about knowing that I'll have the resources to develop my play makes me really excited to get back into it. Great. Thank you. Well, we're very excited to be working with all of you this summer and for us to navigate this new world together. Um, and uh, we're also excited for everybody out there to join us and be a part of the process. We're so grateful that you're here with us today. And even though we won't be gathering in person, the mission of the festival will still be the same. And we want you to be a part of that story and this journey over the next few months as we get to know these playwrights and also uh, have the festival in July. So we're gonna do one final toast. Um, so if everybody can grab, and I'm actually gonna get something real this time because I've just been drinking water, but now that we're at the end. Um, get it. And <laughs> yes, and a final toast to our playwrights this summer and to Noelle, Stephanie, Jordan, Deneen, and Tyler, cheers. Woohoo! <laughs> and we also want to hear from you what you're excited about. So before you jump off, you know, in the comment box, share with us what you're excited about and what you're looking forward to um, with these plays that you just heard about. And also stick around. Um, Dan's music will be playing for the next like, you know, five or 10 minutes. So if you just want to leave the stream on and listen to Dan Wolf, who is performing at the beginning, please do. Um, but we're grateful for you. Um, and last but not least, a huge shout out to our festival producer, Liana Keys, who has been stage managing this whole event and learning a new skill. And also our Playwrights Foundation staff, Michelle Bank and Tessa King. Um, appreciate everyone. All right. Bye. Bye.
I'm blood and bones, I'm skin and scars I'm imperfection captured inside these bars Fully human, fully flawed, seeking inspiration I wanna drop a jaw, I'm waiting for my call I'm insurrection, in need of a direction Don't need a mention, just witness my protection Of all that's sacred, I only keep what I need I plant a seed, while you cut someone just to watch them bleed I got mouths to feed, minds to grow My wife to love, dreams deferred That's why I gotta show my soul in many lights In many forms, in many faces Many tongues as I travel through many spaces It takes bread to break bread, I make bread Out of tef, like step, I wanna shake head Shake with the right, take with the left Leave with the best, the pressure's immense The task is the test Hit to the fence, let's go yard uh, All of a sudden the old guard Soft in the middle but show hard Day to day to keep living, it's so hard Eyes prized and chins raised And these days I give less and less of these flames to these fakes They take and took and robbed and schemed a way to make this place a nightmare Not a dream, it's not, look what we have become It's, this is the way it's always been This is just who they are The time is now to get them out, let's begin Introduction. I never was, will be accepted, but I will not accept it My bloodline could be swept under the same rug, locked up So many families affected uh, So many people need protection So many living without love, without direction In the midst of all this mental illness and neglect We'd rather sit in silence, never mention I'm blood and bones, I'm skin and scars Imperfection trapped inside these bars Fully human, fully flawed, I wanna drop a jaw I'm waiting for y'all, I'm waiting for y'all I'm introspection, looking for a session Just like an actor, looking for direction To tell my story, it's what I need To empower my seeds, to do it better Than the predecessor made it bleed I got mouth to go, the work is clear Intention set, the dream is here Fear is gone, the fight is now The first to win, last to learn The world that burns, we gotta make amends I'm hurt.